when students enter the school classroom, they do not shed their constitutional rights at the door. In this presentation, School Rights Part 1, you will discover the free speech rights that students possess, the speech that is restricted, and the cases of yesterday and today that have, that have interpreted the law for school officials. As you have already learned, our citizens' rights emanate from the Bill of Rights and student free speech rights do not differ. The First Amendment, our basic foundation of democracy, reads, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or the press or the right of pe people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. For years, it appeared that students did not have any constitutional rights, particularly free speech, until the, that right was challenged in the landmark case Tinker versus Des Moines at a public school in Des Moines, uh, Iowa, students organized a silent protest against Vietnam as was be taking place across the country at that time. Students planned to wear black armbands to school to protest the fighting, but the principal found out and told the students they would be suspended if they wore the armbands. Despite the warning, John and Mary Beth Tinker, along with another student, wore the armbands and were suspended. The student's parents sued the school on the grounds that the school violated their children's free speech right. A U.S. district and circuit courts both sided with the school, ruling that wearing armbands could disrupt learning. However, the students appealed to the Supreme Court. In a 1969 7-2 decision, the judges found that the armbands were basically pure speech and that the school's suspensions were unconstitutional because the school had not demonstrated that the armbands caused a material and substantial disruption with schoolwork or discipline. As a result of this ruling, substantial disruption became the tinker standard for future cases. The next significant free speech case was Bethel versus Fraser in 1986. As a school, at a school assembly with about 600 high school students present, Matthew Fraser made a speech nominating a fellow student for a class office in his speech. Fraser used graphic sexual metaphors to promote his friend. Fraser was later suspended from school in violation of the school's disciplinary code, which prohibited the use of obscene, profane language or gestures. Fraser's parents felt the suspension was an abridgment of Matthew's First Amendment rights. The U.S. District and Circuit Courts both in Fraser, found in Fra Fraser's favor. The school board appealed the ruling to the U.S. Supreme Court. By seven to two margin, the Supreme Court held that school officials acted within the Constitution by disciplining Fraser and upheld the school's suspension. With this ruling, students' free speech is restricted when they use obscene language, uh, vulgar and lewd expressions in school. Thus, the Frazier standard for future situations was pronounced. The body of legal guidance has grown, re uh, grown regarding technology-related student free speech rights. Unfortunately for school officials, U.S. circuit courts offer mixed opinions. The fourth and eighth circuits have expressly treated student off-campus speech on social media as equal to uh, on-campus speech subject to sc uh, school discipline within Tinker and Frazier standards. But the Third Circuit has expressed doubt as to whether Tinker standards apply to this type of student speech outside school time. The Second Circuit decisions have vacillated. Although the National School Board Association tried to get the U.S. Supreme Court to make a command decision, the court chose not to hear the cases, leaving school officials without clear legal guidance whether off-campus technology-related posts are protected speech or whether schools can restrict and punish students for such. In an example, the Dwyer versus Oceanport School District case was decided against the school. Dwyer created a wiki at home called I Hate, I hate Multiple uh, I, excuse me, I Hate Maple Place that included a, f a forum allowing other students to post critical remarks about the school and staff. Dwyer himself posted uh, that he did not want anyone uh, 
saying anything profane, uh, profane on his wiki and wanted others to do the same. The U.S. District Court judge in the Third Circuit ruled that the school's disciplinary actions, including a five-day school suspension, month suspension from the baseball team, and ban from the eighth grade field trip, violated Ryan's free speech rights, deprived him of his right to a free education, and inflicted emotional distress on his family. The U.S. District Court ordered the district pay Dwyer $117,500 to settle compl the complaint, ruling that the administrators acted unconstitutionally. In two other cases uh, against the school, J.S. Snyder versus Blue Mountain School District and Layshock Shock versus Hermitage School District, students created a parody uh, Facebook profile at home to mock the school's principal principals. Although the fake accounts did not name the principals, both included the principals' pictures with belittling statements about their sexuality. In both cases, school authorities suspended the offending students. The Third Circuit Court judicial panels in both cases ruled that the Facebook profiles did not disrupt school campuses. Thereby, they overruled the school's punishments and protected these students' free speech rights. On the other hand, there have been technology-rated off-campus free speech rulings that, f that favored the school. In Winooski versus Board of Education of Weedsport Central School District, Aaron Winooski, an eighth grader, sent instant messages to several of his friends using his home computer. The instant messages contained an icon that Aaron had uh, designed showing the, a picture of, the, uh, of a pistol firing at a man's head with the words, kill Mr. Vandermolen, who was one of Aaron's teachers. Upon learning about the icon, school officials initially suspended Aaron for five days, but the punishment was extended to a full semester after the superintendent's expulsion hearing. The school also banned Aaron from participating in extracurricular activities during, his time, during this time. Aaron and his parents sued the school district and the superintendent in a New York federal court, alleging that the expulsion violated Aaron's First Amendment rights. The district court granted the school district's motion for summary judgment, ruling that the icon constituted a cyberbullying true th threat, which is not protected by the First Amendment. On appeal, the Second Circuit affirmed the lower court's ruling. In two other cases, the courts have upheld school actions restricting student speech uh, rights. In Riqua versus Kent School District, number 41, students secretly video recorded a teacher during school hours without permission. Later, the video was edited with graphics as well as musical soundtrack and, and uploaded to YouTube. When district personnel heard about the video, students were suspended for violating a school policy and causing a substantial disruption. One student filed a lawsuit in a U.S. district court claiming First Amendment violations. The court declared that the school district properly suspended the student for videotaping against a written school policy, although the judges did not address the student's free speech rights. The court did note the video caused a material and substantial disruption to the school's operation under Tinker standards. And the repeated lewd and offensive rap music, along with student gestures, met Frazier's parameters. In Doniger versus Nyhoff, Avery Doniger sent emails via a school computer on a non-school web account to rally adult support and reverse administrative decisions regarding a school music festival she organized. Following a flurry of responses directed at the administration, the student received a stern verbal reprimand and a note was temporarily placed in her file. The administration then threatened to cancel the festival. At home, Avery posted the incident on her blog and called the administrators douchebags. When they uh, learned of uh, this, they barred her candidacy for senior class secretary despite her apology. A complaint for injunct injunctive relief was filed in a U.S. District Court and denied upon appeal the, of the Second Circuit Court, which affirmed the lower court's ruling and upheld the school's decision. Now let's look at another aspect of the First Amendment, censoring expression. January 13, 1983. Supreme Court of the United States, Colmeyer versus the Hazelwood School District.
The lawyers of this case are Robert P. Bain, Jr. for the petitioners and Leslie D. Edwards defending the respondents. In 1983, the principal at Hazelwood High School had removed articles he deemed inappropriate. These editorials were about teenage pregnancy and divorce. He was asked to make this decision by Howard Emerson, a substitute teacher finishing the year for Robert Sturgos, the regular Journalism II teacher. The students, Kathy Kohlmeyer, Leslie Smart, and Leon Tippett, viewed the deletion of the two pages from the paper that included the articles as an unconstitutional breaching of their First Amendment rights and took this issue to court, suing in 1984. The district court rejected that Hazelwood students' claims, finding the school officials could restrict student speech and activities that are an integral part of the school's educational function, such as a school-sponsored newspaper. The district court also ruled in its 1985 opinion that the principal's actions were justified. In 1986, a three-judge panel of the 8th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals reversed the district court. The school district appealed the decision to the United States Supreme Court. In a 5-3 decision, the majority of the Supreme Court justices believed that the educators did not offend the First Amendment with editorial control over the content of student speech as long as their actions were reasonably related to legitimate pedagogical concerns. Those dissenting were Justice Brennan, Justice Marshall, and Justice Blackmun. Those in favor were Justice Rehnquist, Justice White, Justice Stevens, and Justice O'Connor, and Justice Scalia. This landmark's, landmark Supreme Court decision held that official school newspapers may be censored by school officials if the school has established that the forum for student expression is closed, thereby subject to a lower level of First Amendment rights than if the forum was open. As defined by the Hazelwood case, the Supreme Court ruled that a school was not a public forum which is a place uh, held for general communication by the public. Thus, teachers may limit a student's speech in class or at school events. A limited public forum is a place with a more limited history of expression, uh, expressive activity, such as a classroom. In keeping with the Hazelwood's definitions of forum at school, in today's world, a closed public forum is a place that has not been open to public expression, and restrictions will be upheld as long as they are reasonable. Thus, a school website mentioned as a closed form may be restricted by school personnel even if students are given opportunities to add content onto the website. Teachers may create closed forms with classroom uh, or school blogs, wikis, and wikis. Therefore, teachers and administrators should understand that they also have every right to censor student content in podcasts as well as student-created videos, especially when it is expressed through board policy or class rules that these works are produced in a limited or closed form and cause a material and substantial disruption. When school officials or teachers give students student editors or creators the authority to make their own content decisions through an unofficial or an official board policy or by allowing the students to operate with editorial independence, they have created an open form. If a student product is considered an open form, then students are entitled to a stronger First Amendment protection. On the matter of student expression in dress as a First Amendment right, the Blau versus Fort Thomas case illustrates that the right to wear blue jeans or other outfits may be prohibited and is not a fundamental right entitled to First Amendment protection. In this case, the court ruled the school district clearly has the authority to enforce its dress code. The next case, Morris versus uh, Frederick represents First Amendment rights as a protest as or peaceable the demonstration. Court was carried through Juneau, Alaska on its way to the 2002 Olympics, Douglas Public High School let students stand on city streets to watch it pass by. When it did, Douglas student Joe Frederick unfurled this banner, Bong Hits for Jesus. 
I find it absurdly funny. I was not promoting drugs. I assumed most people would take it as a joke. His school principal didn't. She tore down the banner and suspended him. Frederick sued, arguing his constitutional rights were violated. He was a citizen exercising free speech in a public place at a public event. But the school argues... It was a field trip where the school was able and did exercise its authority. In this case, to prevent kids from being exposed to arguably pro-drug messages, according to its attorney, Kenneth Starr. Schools should be able to put a stop to these kinds of pro-drug culture messages. To add to the fact pattern, Frederick skipped school that day and stood on the opposite side of the street uh, from the other students who attended the event as part of a school supervised activity. The school's principal, Deborah Morris, told Frederick to put away the barrier, or the banner, as she was concerned it would, could be interpreted as advocating illegal drug activity. After Frederick refused to comply, she took the banner from him. Frederick originally was suspended from school for 10 days for violating school policy, which forbids advocating the, the use of illegal drugs. The court upheld the principal's suspension and held that schools may take steps to safeguard those entrusted to their care from speech that can reasonably be regarded as encouraging illegal drug use without fear of violating a student's First Amendment rights. Circuit court guidance is becoming clearer on restricting free speech rights in cyberbullying harassment cases as the courts examine where the material was created and is there a connection between the acts and a likely or apparent disruption to the school to warrant school actions. In J.S. versus Bethlehem Area School District, an eighth grade student, Justin Swidler, from Mishman Middle School in Pennsylvania created a website titled Teacher Sucks on his home computer. The site which the student claimed was done in jest, included derogatory comments and foul language about the student's algebra teacher and principal, including an image of the teacher, teacher's face morphing into Adolf Hitler, a picture of her severed head dripping with blood, and a request that visitors to the site contribute $10 to cover the cost of a hitman. The teacher was awarded $500,000 for damages caused by the privacy invasion, and the teacher's husband was granted $50,000 in separate civil court proceedings. In a peer-to-peer -peer cyberbullying case, Kara Kowalski used her home computer to create the MySpace page called Students Against Sluts Herpes and invited 100 people to join the page. The content of the web page was mainly devoted to ridiculing a fellow student. The victim and her parents filed an harassment complaint with the school administration. After an investigation of the site and an interviews with Kowalski, the administration concluded that Kowalski had created a hate website, which was a violation of the school's policy against harassment, bullying, and intimidation. The school then served Kowalski with a five-day suspension and a 90-day social suspension prohibiting her attendance at school events. Kowalski sued and the school, uh, the school alleging her suspension violated her First Amendment rights and argued that the school administration was not justified in restricting her speech on the web page because the speech was private and out of school. The Fourth Circuit determined that the speech was a true threat uh, and also uh, that there was the potential for uh, foreseeable substantial disorder and disruption. Therefore, this was not speech a school is required to tolerate and did not merit First Amendment protection. Many other cyberbullying cases with similar outcomes involve text messages, wikis, blogs, Facebook, YouTube videos, and websites. Many cyberbullying cases have come before the courts in which the court has found in favor of the school. However, the water, waters of cyberbullying case law are still murky due to variability in opinions and perspectives across jurisdiction. In J.C. versus Beverly Hills United School District, J.C., a 13-year-old student in California, went to an off-campus restaurant with friends and video recorded them using profanity to ridicule another student, CC. 
using a home computer, JC uploaded the video to YouTube and contacted other students about it, including CC, who was asked by JC shortly after the video was posted on YouTube whether she should pull it down. And CC told JC not to do so. CC's parent was upset about the video and brought the matter to the school's attention. The principal suspended JC, although there was no evidence any student viewed the video at school because the school had a filter on YouTube videos. JC and her parents alleged her suspension under the First Amendment uh, uh, challenged her suspension, uh, and the school board uh, argued that it had to deal with an upset parent and student and that five other students had to miss some class because of the investigation. The California U.S. District Judge Stephen Wilson ruled that the school overreached in punishing J.C. for her statements on the YouTube video. In theory, the Beverly Vista High School principal has the authority to punish students over an online video shared off campus. However, in Judge Wilson's view, J.C.'s particular example of online off-campus expression did not rise to a substantial disruption of school and was simply not extreme enough to justify the school's disciplinary actions. As you have discovered in this presentation, the school administrator must be very keen to the situation's fact pattern before taking disciplinary action against a student's free speech right. Thanks for your attention.